patients think that only one medication is anesthesia. And it's usually not. It involves many different medications. And I'm going to go over the most common medications that are given that pretty much I can say that I give in every single case. So we're going to start with the lidocaine. I give that medication because the next medication, the propofol, which is the medication that actually puts you to sleep, that medication sometimes burns a little bit because some of the preservatives Inside the propofol, the benzene actually burns a little bit. It's like putting alcohol when you have an open wound, it burns. So I give the lidocaine before in order to try to prevent that burning. And some people don't feel the propofol going in at all, while others do complain of a small burning sensation while I was injecting. I already talked about the propofol, which is the medication that is given to actually put you to sleep. The next medication that is giving is actually a paralyzing agent. Fortunately for us, the heart is not a skeletal muscle, so it does not stop the heart, but it relaxes all the skeletal muscles. And I need that in order to maneuver your mouth in order to ventilate you. Obviously, you can intubate someone without a muscle relaxant, but it's made much more difficult without it. And it can cause trauma to the vocal cords. After the muscle relaxant is given, the patient is asleep and their airway is secured, then comes prophylactic medications that are given. So I give an antibiotic, and this is prophylactically, to avoid, to try to minimize the chances of you getting an infection. So my multimodal approach to trying to avoid possible nausea and vomiting after surgery usually involves adequate hydration, the dexamethasone, and the Zofran in conjunction. A lot of times I'll redose the Zofran towards the end of the procedure, like 20 minutes before the end of the procedure to try to even further minimize that chance of the patient having nausea. Because a lot of times, nausea and vomiting after surgery are actually worse than feeling pain. So what is keeping the patient asleep during this whole time during the procedure? Was it the propofol? No. The propofol was only used to place the patient to sleep in the first place. If I actually only had given the propofol once in the beginning of the case, within 10 minutes, the patient would have started to wake up on their own. So after the patient has the endotracheal tube in and their airway is secured, I'm not only delivering oxygen from the anesthesia machine, I'm also delivering anesthesia gases. And the gas I mostly use is isofluorine. So the isofluorine comes in liquid form but actually it goes through a vaporizer in the anesthesia machine and that vaporizes that liquid and delivers anesthesia gases to the patient throughout the whole time. And as long as it's on and I'm constantly delivering anesthesia gases to the patient, they're maintained to sleep. When we reach the end of the procedure, I turn off those anesthesia gases that are keeping you asleep and you slowly start coming to. I also give you neostigmine and glycopyrrolate, which are medications to reverse that muscle relaxant that was given in the beginning of the case so you're strong enough to breathe on your own. I also give you Toradol, which is a, which is a powerful non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for pain. And I already usually have given a little bit of fentanyl in the beginning of the case and sometimes throughout the case, but towards the end of the case, I always redose a little bit of fentanyl to kind of smooth things along and try to keep you pain-free for when I deliver you to recovery. So that's about it. Those are the medications that I usually give when I'm giving an anesthetic. And I hope this helps you understand a little bit better of how anesthesia works. I'll see you next time.